friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear brothers and sisters, as you will hear from my voice, I'm not in the best of shape. So, <laughs> so I've dragged myself from bed. I'm going to do this, and I'm going straight back to bed. So if I start coughing too much at some point, please forgive me. I was asked to reflect a little bit on my journey on activism, and I thought I'd be quite personal. Uh, at the age of about 14, I started reading about Steve Biko's inquest. Some of you might remember Steve Biko was murdered in prison and so on. And much to the concern of my parents at that time, whenever they saw us reading what little you could read in the newspapers about what was happening in the country, they got super scared because parents were scared about their children becoming activists and then, as they used to tell us always from the age of 14, you do those kinds of things, you will end up with Mandela on Robben Island. That was like a mantra you were told. Then tragically, my mum committed suicide in 1980 at the age of 38, which was also the moment when this, there was this massive uprising of young students standing up against the inequality in the education system. And in fact, to be honest, I was 15, I didn't really understand too much. And our fa first favorite slogan that we made was, you pay our teachers peanuts, no wonder they give us monkey education. And I have this rec recollection of a march, my first march as a 15-year-old, where the slogan at the front of the march was, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the back of the march, folks were chanting, chanting we want a color TV. Because, because kids in white schools had color TVs and we in black schools had no TVs. In fact, uh, in fact the primary school I went to for the first six years uh, only had very limited electricity. But the thing that inspired one to take action was simply a choice, a moral choice being put before you by inspiring people around you saying, my boy, my girl, we were kids. You have a choice to make. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And you need to understand that if you take a position of neutrality in the face of extreme injustice, then you need to know that the choice you're making is not a choice of neutrality, but a choice to be part of the system. Then my mum, uh, who was a major inspiration on me, taught us some things before she left this place, where she always used to say things like, it is much better to try and fail than to fail to try. That's probably one of the most important inspirational messages I learned as a young person. Because far too many people in the world today have been mentally subjugated to a point where we do not believe that our activities and efforts will bring the kind of change that the world desperately needs now. But is the choice then of, well, if it's only a small chance we can win against such a massive challenge of an apartheid state with the best army in the African continent backed by its allies in the Western world and so on, even for that small choice, small possibility that you can make change, we have an ethical responsibility, was the inspiration I received. Doesn't matter you fail, but history will judge your silence and your inaction in a very, very dire way. The other important thing I learned from my mom was I went home one day very traumatized because my favorite teacher at school was had just converted from one religion to another, right? And you know when people convert to anything, you know, whether they give up smoking, whether they, whatever they do, the new converts are the most passionate ones, right? So he was like, you know, he was my favorite teacher, so I go home and I say, mom, you know, this teacher said that this religion is the best in the world and you have to really, you know, kind of consider it. So my mom said to me, my boy, the most important thing you need to know about religion is this. 
if you can see God in the eyes of every human being you meet, and if you can always look for the weaknesses in yourself and the strengths in other people, that's the best religious philosophy you can follow. Because if you look at the weaknesses in others, usually there's not much you can do about their weaknesses, but if you look at the weaknesses in yourself, hopefully there's something you can do about it. Now, I shared with you these personal sort of anecdotes which I've not actually done as publicly as I've done here this morning, because I'm also going myself through a very contemplative period in my life about asking myself the questions about working 24-7, pushing on these different agendas to make the world a better and more just and more safe place. Is it okay to continue to fight in a way that we are not winning fast enough and we continue to often in the broader NGO movement, particularly in the more professionalized uh, NGO movement which we are part of, we often are taking comfort from winning battles and having a particular success with this project or this initiative or this campaign when our analysis in the final and at the higher level, we know that actually that impact of that change has largely been incremental and not transformative. And that is why when I heard that your theme was inspire, connect and transform, I really wanted to, to join you today because I think it's critically important that we must ask ourselves the question, is our work about doing good things or is our work about fundamentally transforming society such that the systemic and structural changes that we need to have an enduring, peaceful, just, equitable, and sustainable world is a, po uh, is a possibility. <coughs> so, <coughs> just to look at the world we live in today. Today, we live in a world which is characterized by many weaknesses, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to quickly bullet point them. Firstly, we have a deep democratic deficit. Yes, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, there are more countries in the world that actually have elections, but in fact, this notion that elections equals democracy must be challenged very, very strongly because in many countries today, we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. So if you look at the United States, for example, which its leaders often see itself as promoters of democracy, today you can describe the United States as the best democracy money can buy. And when you unpack which money buys that power, it's disproportionately oil, coal, gas, nuclear, military, and other polluting industries. Let me give you one shocking statistic. For every member in the US Congress, the oil, coal, and gas industry comes up with enough money to employ a minimum of three and a max, up to a maximum of eight full-time lobbyists to make sure that no progressive climate legislation goes through in the United States, right? That's just one statistic. I can, sh I can depress you with many more. Uh, and then on gender equality, I find it very curious how, in fact, many people stand up sporadically and talk about gender equality, particularly in political leadership. But the preachers of gender equality are not doing that great themselves. And I'll stay with the United States as an example, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, there's a museum in, the, in Washington, D.C., which is the ball gowns the spouses of the president used on inauguration night. And it's only gowns. There's not one suit there, right? And the point I want to make is, and I'll do this in the context of Zimbabwe, when in my previous job at Civicus, we were pushing to get the government of Robert Mugabe to respect human rights and so on, I was encountered, I encountered a 
intelligence agents of the Zimbabwe government while I was in Zimbabwe. He was following me around different places and eventually somebody pointed it out and I just went and had a conversation. I said, I, I understand you're from the intelligence agency. Can I have a chat? The guy was a bit taken back and he said, yeah, uh, let's talk. And then eventually he said something like, listen, we in Zimbabwe will not make the claim that we're the perfect democracy, perfect respecter of the human rights and so on, but why is Civicus and all the other human rights organizations coming after us so hard when we are not doing Guantanamo Bay, we are not doing extraordinary rendition, uh, for those of you who forgot what the uh, extraordinary rendition was, it was capturing people in one country, torturing them in the next, and dumping them in the third, which was a CIA program. And, uh, and you know, we are not doing racial and religious pro profiling, etc., etc. Of course, they were doing a whole lot of other awful things. But the point is that what we are seeing, and fundraisers are not immune from this reality. Since the horrific events of September 11th, 2001, we have seen a shrinking of democratic space. And this shrinking of democratic space has had a range of impacts on how civil society operates. And if you look at the Patriot Act, for example, there are things that have impacted on how monies can be raised in the US and transferred elsewhere and so on. And I'm just saying to you that this has been a generalized impact. Now, countries with weaker democratic traditions rubbed their hands like this when they saw what was happening post 9-11. They said, ha-ha, these countries claim to be promoters of democracy, and if they're shrinking democratic space, voila, we can also do it even better than them. And so what you have seen is that, yes, in countries with stronger democratic traditions, citizens are fighting back in the United States, in the UK, and elsewhere to claim some of the space that was lost, but let's be very clear that, in fact, there's lot, much more to be done. The other problem we have today is global governance. For many of the challenges that humanity faces, we cannot address these issues by treating them as a national issue. Climate change is a good example. Terrorism is another. Even an issue like HIV AIDS, because the pricing of life-saving pharmaceutical drugs is not happening at a national level. It's governed by an organization called WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, and so on. And when we look at the multiple issues that we need to address today, clearly these issues don't support, uh, they are not restricted by boundaries, as sadly the Ebola crisis is now actually showing. So the problem we have though is that most of these global governance institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF, the UN even, and so on, they are stuck in a logic of the geopolitics of 1945. They suffer from a democratic deficit, a legitimacy deficit, a um, compliance deficit. By what I mean by compliance deficit, there's these multiple UN summits and so on. They agree things, but then they don't comply and implement. And fundamentally, uh, they suffer from an accountability deficit. So the terrible situation we have is that we need global institutions more and more at the moment but they are even less and less capable to actually address the challenges that we face. The third problem we have is social exclusion. You know, some years ago, when I first came here actually, in fact, about 14 years ago, I did this very same lecture, the closing lecture at this conference. And at that time, when we talked about social exclusion, social exclusion was largely seen about things that affected minorities, right? But actually, Stop and think about it for a moment. Who is socially excluded in the world today? And let's add up the numbers. In many countries, young people are socially excluded. Women, older people. That's one of the tragedies, I think, of our existence as a human family on this planet, that in fact, our older people are seen as people to be dealt with rather than a resource to be drawn from. And similarly, we treat young people in, in similar ways. And then, of course, you know, people living with disabilities, indigenous peoples, religious, ethnic, linguistic minorities, and so on. You add all those numbers up, you come to a very, very uncomfortable conclusion that actually the number of people that feel genuinely socially in included in their societies on this planet are actually smaller in number rather than uh, those that feel uh, excluded. And that's why that 
distinction of the 99% versus the 1% resonated with so many people around the world. And within that context, the role of civil society is critically important. But you will know from your own experience that in fact, many of our governments and our business leaders are very, very comfortable when we as civil society step up and say, there are poor children that need education or need feeding programs, and we want to raise money and provide those programs. Or if you take an issue like violence against women, if you want to set up a shelter and provide women with safe refuges and counsel, counseling and so on, everybody says, oh, you're a saint, well done. But when you start saying, actually, we need domestic violent legislation to prevent women having to land up in those shelters in the first place, then, in fact, you get told, well, that's not your job, who elected you, etc., etc. So we must be very clear that our governments, when they go on about civil society and how important civil society is, to a large extent, with exceptions, they are mostly comfortable with our service delivery role. They are not really comfortable with a role where we say what is needed is not incremental changes, what is needed is not reorganizing the deck chairs on the Titanic while it's sinking. What is actually needed is quite visionary, transformative, innovative system redesign that is needed. And we as civil society must not give up that fight to say that we have a right to deliver the services to the most vulnerable as we do, and that is probably what will continue to be the majority of what civil society does, but to assert that our voice around policy and our voice around governance is as critically important as well. Then I want to move to the next slide, which talks about the climate and environmental crisis in particular. Let me say that the biggest mistake, I think, the environmental movement, or one of the biggest mistakes the environmental movement made decades ago, was to allow climate change to be talked about primarily or exclusively at one point as an environmental problem. Because let's be very clear, climate change is a cross-cutting issue. And I've been waiting a long time to start a sentence like the one I'm about to start, which might shock you given my earlier comments about the CIA. I strongly support the CIA and the Pentagon. When in 2003, in a report to President Bush, they said, in the coming two decades, this is 2003, the biggest threats to peace, security, and stability will not come from conventional threats and will not come from terrorism or any other known threats, but will come from the impacts of climate change. Today, in the United States, some of the most eloquent voices on climate change are actually people who were ex-military, and interestingly, there are also people now within the military that are talking out more powerfully on climate change than we are seeing um, some of the members of Congress doing. Then, if one of the impacts of climate change is in fact war, conflict, and so on, then you can make another connection. And that connection is with the issue of women and children's rights. We know, sadly, that in every war and conflict, that women and children suffer disproportionately, right, compared to men in conflict. And yeah, I think, when I <laughs> look at the question of connect, <coughs> that the women's movement gave us a very important wisdom some decades ago, which was very inspiring to me as a young activist, where they, it, it was a very inspiring concept, but a terrible, terrible, cumbersome word. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Okay, the word is intersectionality. Okay, so written by some good feminist uh, theorist, right? But intersectionality, so minus the long word, is essentially saying that if you want to address gender equality, you need to understand how gender intersects with race, class, ability, religion and so on. <coughs> and one of the biggest challenges that we face as civil society is that we are still allowing ourselves to stay in the silos that have been created over time. And while I understand that for the nature of our work, we have to have a measure of specialization, a measure of focus, I think that in fact, 
now is the time for us to re-examine what is the right balance between specialization and integration of our agendas. Because if we do not find the basis to integrate our different agendas, we are going to lose a range of opportunities to make the kinds of changes that we need. But if you look at this diagram, I won't go through all of them, right? But I'll just pick a few. If we take deforestation, as we sit in this hall here today, every two seconds, a forest the size of a football field would have disappeared. That's the reality. After all the campaigning, after all the uh, nice speeches by heads of state and CEOs of big companies that are going to address deforestation, it is still out of control. And we know now that forests are not simply nice places for nice biodiversity that if you are somebody who likes animals and nature and so on that you need to be worried about, but actually we understand now that forests are the lungs of the planet which captures carbon dioxide and stores it safely. And it's critical as a solution to climate change. If we take oceans, uh, two years ago, Newsweek, admittedly not the most radical left-wing or environmentally friendly magazine in the world, carried a front page story saying that within 40 years, all that could be left in our oceans will be algae and jellyfish because of the triple whammy of overfishing, dumping of toxics, including oil spills, as well as, um, as, well as uh, uh, ocean acidification, which is a problem of less and less forests, more and more carbon, and that excess carbon is landing in our oceans, turning it to acid. And climate is the game changer, because the climate negotiations in Copenhagen came up with an unhelpful compromise, which said that we need to keep global warming from the industrial period. Uh, the developing country, least developed countries and the small island states were saying it should not be more than one and a half degrees rise. The developed countries and the big emerging economies pushed for two degrees. And then the compromise in typical UN speak was as far below two degrees as possible, right? Does anybody know where we are now? Where are we now from pre-industrial period towards that one and a half or two degrees? We are at 0 0.8 degrees now. And at 0 0.8 degrees in the last decade, we have had a 100% increase in extreme weather events where we have documented numbers of lives that are being lost by direct climate impacts, where we are seeing massive infrastructure loss as a result of climate impacts. By the way, the continent that is affected most is, in fact, uh, Africa. But Africa, sadly, is getting the bad end of the climate visual uh, deal because the impacts of climate change in Africa is mainly climate-inspired uh, inspired drought. And it's not a cataclysmic event like Hurricane Sandy or uh, Iphoon Tayan in, 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 in Philippines and so on. So, it's real, it's happening, and we are running out of time. And in fact, for some people, probably in Pacific Island states and so on, we probably have run out of time. One of the things that is driving this is an acceptance that we all accept of inequality. And the inequality that exists in the world today is completely, completely unacceptable. We can get everybody in the world to say, Poverty is a very bad thing, we need to address it. But uh, as I learned painfully when I was in New Zealand in uh, 2006, during the Make Poverty History campaign, I was, had the honor to be the global chair of, the, of that campaign. And somebody in the audience uh, in New Zealand got up and said, you know, I want to be very critical with this whole campaign. The name of the campaign is wrong to start with. It should not be make poverty history. It should be make extreme affluence in, uh, history. Because you need to understand that the link between extreme accumulation on the one hand is linked completely to underconsumption of others on the other. So I want to say that today, even you go to the World Economic Forum, everybody is saying, you know, in Davos and elsewhere, inequality is unsustainable, we have to address it and so on. But 
If you look at what plans are there on the table to bridge the gap between rich and poor and to have a much more sane way of thinking about consumption, it's very little. Our friends in WWF have said that if everybody in the world is to have the lifestyles in consumption terms that say we would have as people in the developed world or elites in the developing world, then we need between five and eight planets. So we have to think about how do we manage and share one finite planet in a much more sensible way because we don't have a plan B here because essentially we don't have a planet B to go to even though certain people are looking to see if they can find such a planet. And then when we look at our democracy which has largely been captured by uh, the interests of big oil, big coal, big uh, gas and, and big nuclear and understand that sadly many of our political leaders are actually completely hamstrung and don't have the ability to actually resist the reality of this industry. Because as we sit in this hall, today, annually, the oil, coal, and gas industries receive $1,4 trillion of taxpayer-funded subsidies to help them with their businesses. And then you'll have our government saying, yeah, but you know, solar and wind and geothermal and biomass and so on is not competitive. For decades and decades, they have been benefiting from truckloads of taxpayer-funded subsidies in the logic that energy is so important for national interests. And that is a dynamic that we have to change and change quickly, given that, given that oil, burning of oil, coal, and gas is the biggest driver towards climate catastrophe. So, but this is a uh, David and Goliath struggle. Uh, and I think we must be honest to say that when people ask me how do I think Greenpeace is doing, I say, you know, we're winning very important, significant battles, but I have to be honest that we are losing the war and we are running out of time based on what the science is saying and what uh, extreme weather events uh, is telling us. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just brought out their report which said some amazing things. They've said that we need to leave between 60 to 85% of known oil, coal, and gas reserves where they are if we <coughs> have to stand a chance to keep warming uh, below 2 degrees. Uh, and, and understand this. Once we hit those limits, all the science is telling us is that we will have catastrophic runaway uh, climate change. They cannot say exactly how catastrophic or how devastating it will be. But right now, if we see the early onset of conflict in places like Africa, we can see that when water, food, and land are in scarce supply, that sadly, the brutality of humanity comes to the fore, not the compassion of humanity. So getting this right is not simply about you know, preventing some environmental crisis, it's about determining how this world will look like in future. Now, let me just stop there and make a confession because I'm checking out your faces in the audience. Because I know I was told I have to inspire you. <laughs> and, 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 and let me tell you as an anecdote the difficulty of my job right now. And I'll do it through an anecdote. I was addressing a group of grant makers in uh, the US, environmental grant makers, uh, audience almost the size in New York, and I was going on in more detail about you know, where we are on climate, where we are on forests, where we are on oceans, where we are on toxics. And an irate woman put up her hand at the end of my speech and said, Dr. Naidu, have you ever heard of Martin Luther King? So I said, yes, I did. And then she said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? And I said, uh, I thought it was a trick question, so I very tentatively said, I have a dream. And she said, yes, it was called I have a dream. When I hear you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare. So let me just say that, that, that we cannot have a conversation. You know, we have to speak truth to power, and, but we have to say how serious it is by also saying that, in fact, it's within our capability to make the changes. Sadly, for some people on this planet, 
it's a bit too late. Certainly, the people who have already moved off uh, certain islands in Fiji and uh, Papua New Guinea, for example, it's too late for them. They've lost their homelands, right? And the people who have lost uh, their grazing lands and so on in certain parts of Africa, it is too late. Let, let, we have to be honest to say that the science told us this already in 1992. It was quite clear, and then we allowed the powerful interests to do what they continue to do right now. And so essentially what we are suffering from uh, is our political and business leaders have a terrible case of cognitive dissonance where all the facts are there. It's saying they need to act. And by the way, we were just with them now at the UN Climate Summit in New York. They were coming up to us and saying to the civil society people, congratulations, you'll have won the debate, uh, you'll really, po you know. Uh. Well, th the problem is, acknowledging it and then saying that we will just do baby steps in the right direction when in fact we've lost so much of time to make the changes that we need is just not good enough. By the way, to my friends in the UK, any s resemblance to Tony Blair is completely accidental. <laughs> but let's think about quickly how we understand the world we live in. And and, and how we, as people who see ourselves as change agents and pose an uncomfortable question to ourselves, which is a question I'm posing to myself increasingly these days, about whether, in fact, we need to think about how our brain operates in the current challenges. And I want to share such a moment that Martin Luther King confronted in the high Modern school. psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is a word maladjusted. It is a ring and cry of modern child psychology, maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But as I move toward my conclusion, I would like to say to you today, in a very honest manner, that there are some things in our society and some things in our world for which I'm proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. The reason I showed you this is to really make the point that I think that we are human beings working in the nonprofit sector called civil society. We are not immune from the pressures of media, the pressures of conforming, the pressures of complying. And, and as fundraisers, we have to do it all the time, right? We have all these things we have to comply uh, with. In fact, if we don't, we are not able to legally fundraise, for example. But I do believe passionately, dear brothers and sisters, we have to ask ourselves as individuals, but also as people who work in our different organizations right now, whether in fact we are challenging ourselves sufficiently enough in terms of thinking about, for example, consumption patterns. What kind of consumption do we really need on this planet for people to live a decent life? Is the levels of inequality acceptable? How can we actually move from where we are to a mo much more equitable world? None of this is easy. None of this is uh, a walk in the park. And it does sometimes mean we ourselves. Certainly speaking for myself, sometimes it gives you such a big headache, you think, okay, let me just deal with a thing that I can take control of and deliver and maybe just help five people rather than trying to transform the world for you know, five million people, let me at least take on a struggle where I can see the fruits of my labor. And if I can be honest with you, all my years of activism, I have needed that personally. I've needed, like when I was 19 years old, I was a living house father in a children's home. And I needed that because I needed to do something 
where I could see that actually I was helping people and people were benefiting in a direct way. And I don't see a contradiction between service delivery and systemic and transformative change. Because I think the problem we have sometimes is too many people working on systemic and transformational change are doing it from an experiential vacuum. You know what I mean? That they are not doing it from having engaging with ordinary people who are facing those issues that they are working with. Who better to inform you about what kind of shelters we need for women who are escaping domestic violence than women who have actually experienced it, right? So when we look at that, I thought this quotation from Cornell West, he said, if your success is defined as being well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference, then we don't want successful leaders. We want great leaders who love the people enough and respect the people enough to be unbought, unbound, unafraid, and unintimidated to tell the truth. Now, therefore, when we ask about what history teaches us about how change happens, we know that whether it was slavery, women's right to vote, apartheid, civil rights in the US, and many, many more struggles, those struggles only went, moved forward when decent men and women stood up and said, enough is enough and no more. We're prepared to put our lives on the line if necessary. We're prepared to go to prison if necessary. And writing in the 1950s, um, Howard Zinn, a labor historian in uh, the United States, talks about civil disobedience. Now, this, by the way, is not Howard Zinn. It's, it's Matt Damon reading at a festival after Howard Zinn died in commemoration. So he's reading something that Zinn wrote in the 50s. The topic is civil disobedience. You're saying our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war. And millions have been killed because of this obedience. We recognize this for Nazi Germany. We know that the problem there was obedience, that the people obeyed Hitler. People obeyed. That was wrong. They should have challenged, and they should have resisted. <laughs> but now we have Western civilization, the rule of law. The rule of law has regularized and maximized the injustice that existed before the rule of law. That is what the rule of law has done. When in all the nations of the world, the rule of law is the darling of the leaders and the plague of the people, we ought to begin to recognize this. We have to transcend these national boundaries in our thinking. Nixon and Brezhnev have much more in common with one another than we have with Nixon. J. Edgar Hoover has far more in common with the head of the Soviet secret police than he has with us. It's the international dedication to law and order that binds the leaders of all countries in a comradely bond. That's why we're always so surprised when they get together. They smile, they shake hands, they smoke cigars. They really like one another no matter what they say. <laughs> we're going to need to go outside the law to stop obeying the laws that demand killing or that allocate wealth the way it's been done or that put people in jail for petty technical offenses and keep other people out of jail for enormous crimes. Now this is a difficult challenge for us because we work within the rule of law, right? Uh, most of us respect the rule of law. Uh, we have to do that just to survive and exist as organizations. Otherwise we'll be shut down even more quickly. Uh, so, this is a difficult thing about trying to figure out how do we work within the broad framework of the law, but do not allow the law to silence us around fundamental, unacceptable injustices that we see happening around us. And one of those injustices, which impacts all of our humanity, is that rich people can always, or not always, can largely get away with the worst crimes that they might commit and steal the largest amounts of money that they can steal. But in fact, usually, those that are poor, those who do not have legal representation and so on, are ones who will spend tons of time in prison for an uh, offense that often is minuscule. 
right? I can give you many, many examples in some of the places that claim to be the promoters of democracy and the bastions of democracy. And it is for that reason when Nelson Mandela was confronted with uh, a choice of what does he say in his trial, his lawyers advised him that he should not take a hard line and advised him against this quote that he said at his final trial before he went to prison, where he said, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for, live for, and to achieve. But if needs be, okay, if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Now, I want to tell you a small secret. Those three words, if needs be, took about three to four days of discussion with lawyers to come up with, right? Because they were trying to send a message that politically to say that good activism is about not uh, romanticizing dying and martyrdom, but actually it's about saying, I love my country enough. I want to live for my country and I want to do things for my country. But if needs be, if needs be, then the choice between not standing up and taking a position against extreme injustice, if needs be, I'd rather die, rather than not live and cherish and create the society that we want to. Now, it's very interesting how the world works, right? Now, you might recognize some of the people here. Of course, that's Nelson Mandela. I should tell you that's a cheat photograph, in the sense that that was a photograph was taken when he went back after he was released. And this year was Martin Luther King when he was in prison on one of the 41 occasions that he was arrested. This is Mahatma Gandhi in prison, one of the many occasions that he was in, uh, arrested. This was in South Africa, by the way. And, <coughs> and that's Rosa Parks, who was part of the civil rights movement uh, on one of the occasions. During their time when they stood up, like how you and I are standing up for the various issues that we are trying to mobilize resources and make a positive effort on, they were vilified, they were ridiculed, they were repressed, and they were thrown in prison, and many were killed. But today, how do we remember them? That there is the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial in Delhi, and there's a national public holiday on his birthday. Man Luther King, National public holiday on his birthday and a uh, memorial in Washington, D.C., as big as any other president's memorial. Rosa Parks has a, um, various memorials in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And Nelson Mandela was the only person in the history of the world whose birthday all the member states of the United Nations, while he was living, declared decided to declare it as an international day for social uh, action and for improvement of the world, 18th of July. And, and of course, he ended up addressing various parliaments and so on. So what I want to say to you is, do not accept that the struggle for justice is a popularity contest, right? Because yes, from a fundraising point of view, right, we are sometimes put into that situation where we have to say, oh, what we're doing is so popular and people will support and so on. And yes, by all means, we need to do that in a thoughtful, creative way. But let's be clear that humanity and history will judge the work that we are all doing here very, very differently from how it possibly is being judged now, right? That it was clear that during the time that they were doing the core of the activism, they were vilified. Today, we draw on them, and these are only some, some of them. I, I must apologize that there's no women, uh, or not many more women in that list, but I, there are many, many people, men and women, young and old, that we can pull up and tell these stories on. But civil disobedience is going to take a little bit of courage. Or more than a what do you bit tell of people who are scared to protest because they're worried that they'll get arrested, beaten, or just simply surveilled in the massive surveillance grid that exists today? 
Well, one, I was blessed to go to jail because I was willing to bear witness and deal with the consequences. I would do it again. But there's no doubt there's an increasing repression. There's an attempt to create a culture, not just of silence, but a culture of fear, especially for the younger generation, to intimidate them, to make sure they're so afraid that they're not willing to step out, bear witness in public, and have to deal with the consequences of, of civil disobedience. We just simply have to have more courage that we're, we're dealing now with a much more autocratic and authoritarian state and you have to be more courageous you have to be more courageous to tell you the truth you have to be more willing to deal with the cost and in the end uh, some of us simply have to die that's all yeah i mean <laughs> the chilling effect is what they're counting on isn't their reaction priceless uh, i mean he said it in a very matter-of-fact way she's in a state of shock Right? She conceptually agrees with what he's saying, right? And let's just look at practically what's happening. Do you know an organization called Global Witness? It's a think tank in London. They work on extractive industries. They just brought us out a report three months ago that says every week two environmental activists get killed in the world, mainly in uh, Latin America and Brazil and other Latin American countries. These are people who might not self-describe themselves as environmentalists, by the way, but these are people who are working on environmental issues around water, land, and so on. So what Cornel West is saying is the reality that's happening. And she fancies herself as a bit more of a progressive, informed uh, journalist, uh, certainly in the context of the United States. Uh, and she was not able to respond because the reality is it's painful what are we being asked for, asked to do. And it's not as if all of us will play the same roles exactly, but the biggest gift we can give those with power is the gift of fear. Because so long as we are not able to scale the wall of fear and to say actually this is important enough that sacrifices have to be made, I might not be the one who's going to be on the front line and who, you know, but I am prepared to be part of a movement that actually already people are dying from repression left, right, and center, and that, in fact, that's something that's okay. And therefore, it's good to sometimes have a person like, uh, uh, what's his name again? <laughs> George Clooney. <laughs> uh, joining us, and I want to say, yeah, that the challenge from a fundraising values and media communications sort of perspective is quite challenging. I remember in 2005, in the height of the Make Poverty History campaign, I, I, and I was the chair, and I was criticized heavily at one point where people said, hey, Kumi, you're being so naive and... And, 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 you know, the celebrities have taken over the campaign. We don't see any of the activists in the media. It's just the celebrities, you know, who are there, you know, Bob Geldof and Bono and, and others. And then I said, but, you know, the reality is, let's be honest, they are the ones who can get the access and get the message out. So sometimes we have to make tactical sort of, you know, decisions to move the agenda forward. And then I got told, yeah, we are suffering from a new problem now in society, which was called celebrocracy. That is a domination by public space by celebrities. All I want to say is that I think it's the right tactical thing for us to use those that are able to amplify our voices. They are not going to be perfect. Their own personal carbon footprints is not going to be fantastic. The houses that they're going to live in is not going to be as simple as the houses that some of us might live in. And the number of cars they have might be a bit extreme and so on. But within all of those limitations, my own view is that we have to recognize that the biggest problem we have is not actually the repressive state apparatus, meaning army, police, detention, and so on. Actually, the bigger problem we have is the ideological state apparatus, which is the media environment, the framework for religion, the education system, the norms and, uh, you know, the social norms and customs which are made to be normal, uh, 
is what actually is the biggest problem. The United States, for example, never needs to use its uh, repressive state apparatus because its ideological state apparatus is so, so powerful, for example. So please understand that both have to be taken uh, very, very seriously. And so with the Save the Arctic campaign, uh, it's been very difficult because most people don't know where the Arctic is or why the Arctic is important. And, and as I say to my friends in the United States, you know, it's not a case of you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas because what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic because the Arctic serves as a refrigerator and air conditioner for the planet. Uh, and, uh, and what happens there has impact on our lives across the planet, not only sea level rise, but wild changes in, 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 uh, in uh, weather patterns and so on. And that's why last year we took this action in the Russian Arctic. The year before, we went and did exactly the same action. And at that time, the Coast Guard was there, no repression and so on. But it went from nothing the year before to piracy charges. A group of Greenpeace activists in custody in Russia is facing possible jail sentences of up to 15 years. On the ship was seized two days after they attempted to board an offshore drilling platform owned by Gazprom. Life has been quite difficult. It's very cold now. I'll stay strong. Everyone sleeps with their clothes I spend on. 23 hours a day in here. The world is talking about Arctic oil. Dear James. Dear supporters, it's been over a month now that the special forces dropped by helicopter and took over our ship at gunpoint. What a terrifying moment, I must admit. Surreal out of an action movie. Since then, life has been quite difficult. We were towed into port under armed guard, Mamansk being the final destination. When we were taken off the ship to be arrested, it felt like a scene from the Cold War. It was dark. I was scared. The hardest moment was the first night in prison. Being shown to my cell and introduced to a couple of strangers was frightening to say the least. The cell is about eight meters long, four meters wide and six meters high. I spend 23 hours a day in here without nothing but the occasional book and my thoughts. The weather has turned to winter. Everyone sleeps with their clothes on. I heard that from December, Mamansk is dark for six weeks. God, I hope I'm out by then. There isn't a moment I don't think about my family. I dream of the day I can run into their arms. Existence here is incredibly bipolar, ranging from the fatalistic a blind panic that I will spend 15 years in a Russian prison cell for a crime I didn't commit. I told my friend Phil that I was worried I couldn't cope. He told me I'd be fine. Always remember, there are a lot of people working very hard to release you. Knowing my friends and family are fighting for me is my source of strength. I spend a lot of time looking out through the window when the sun shines. I think about the Arctic, the sea ice. It makes me happy. It gives me strength. Yesterday, I saw that someone had scratched Save the Arctic into the wall. <laughs> it made me laugh. I am definitely getting stronger. All of us are asking each other the question whether we would do it again, knowing the consequences. Yes, we would. We cannot get threatened and sometimes it is necessary to pay a high price for things we deeply believe in. I hear news of protests all over the world. The world is talking about Arctic oil. There are 30 people whose lives have been changed irrevocably from 18 nations across the world. 28 of those people were standing up for what they believe, and two journalists were there to report that story. Now we have to hope the world will support their rights to do so, and that Russia will listen. Greenpeace is only but a word. The people behind it is our strength. I'm facing a... 
Thank you. I'm facing a little bit dilemma. I'm on the clock, uh, and uh, I have a few minutes left, so I'm going to just race through. And what I want to just say that one of the things we did with the Arctic 30 was to really inspire a real global movement, which has led to the Secretary General of the UN meeting us in a bilateral meeting just two weeks ago, uh, which has got a whole range of voices, high profile as well as low profile, invisible voices to step forward. And now we have six million people campaigning with us to save the Arctic, which is pretty amazing given that it is... Okay, so this is a quick uh, one minute uh, trailer on a movie that tells a story about what happened to the Arctic that they called Black Ice. The entire planet. Why on earth should we destroy all this just within, you know, two, three, four generations? We believe that your platform and the activities being carried out in preparation for drilling for oil in the Arctic Ocean represents a real and immediate threat to the environment both here and globally. Lumnia is the first Arctic offshore oil platform to go into production. These very same companies that are promising to drill responsibly offshore are the same companies working onshore and they have a horrible track record. It's impossible to respond to a major spill in the Arctic Ocean. It is truly a disaster waiting to happen. It's a question of when, where, and how bad it will be. That's what makes it urgent for us to take action. We came to the Arctic to protect the Arctic. What are your intentions? What are your intentions? We go out there, bear witness, tell the world what's happening. Climbing in protests can be dangerous, and I knew that the circumstances would be quite hard. They had made a decision that was not going to happen. This is Russian Corp. I suspect you in terrorism. In terrorism? In terrorism? What you're actually doing is technically an act of war against Netherlands. We just never had a clue they would try to charge us in piracy. Anywhere short of, you know, North Korea, this will not stick. Uh, this was a kind of show trial. They wanted to punish us. That they, they cannot lock up 30 peaceful people from 19 different countries for many years on an accusation as absurd as this. Giving up's not an option. Turning the Arctic over to Gazprom is not an option. We have to tell them, stop. Enough is enough. I believe you can get this online, uh, so I strongly recommend that you look at it. I'd like to just end on a positive note, to say that, you know, we wage all of these campaigns. Some of them take a long time, uh, but I'm glad to say that some of you might have seen this Lego campaign to break that alliance with Shell, and just a week ago, uh, Lego agreed to break that alliance. Side by side you and
So, to conclude, <laughs> thank you. To conclude, I'd like to leave you with some of these messages. We need to be willing to stop playing by the roles imposed by the status quo. Find the right balance. I'm not saying operate in a way that puts all our organizations out of businesses, but I think we need to push the envelope much more than we're doing. Recognize what is at stake is too important for us to continue with the dithering and lack of political will by political and the business leaders. We need to recognize that nature does not negotiate. And while we hear there's lots of conferences about addressing the shifting nature of power, we now need to also address the shifting power of nature. We need to recognize that what is needed right now is not simply system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. What is needed is system redesign, system innovation, and system transformation. And we can only do that if we inspire people and we connect those energies for that transformation as the theme of your conference has shown. We also have to start where people are. One of the biggest mistakes of activism is activists project their consciousness on the people they're trying to organize. And we have to humble ourselves. And if people, because see on the Lego campaign, I can tell you I've received lots of uh, emails from people telling me, what the hell? Lego is made from plastic, plastic uses fossil fuels. Why, in fact, are you even telling people that they should, you know, almost condoning the fact that people should buy Legos, right? You know, sometimes you can create a politically pure position that just you, your dog, and maybe if you're lucky, one other person can live in that pure cultivated political garden. Or if you live in the real world, you have to make the choices between how do you move from where we are to where we need to be. So sometimes it's going to come with compromises. But what I'm saying is I think we need to be challenging ourselves of whether, in fact, we are compromising more than we need to. And I believe very strongly that positive motivation is, is within our grasp. And people, as the Arab resistance shown, as so many grassroots struggles are showing, that people are actually up for getting involved and securing our children and grandchildren's lives. Let me just conclude with this last slide, but just say to you that often you'll hear environmentalists like myself saying, save the planet, save the climate, save the environment. I want to end with some really good news. The planet, dear brothers and sisters, does not need saving. The planet is absolutely fine. Because if humanity warms up to the planet, to the point where humanity cannot exist here anymore, the planet will still be here. We'll be gone. <laughs> and in fact, once we go, the forests will grow back, the oceans will replenish, and so on. So understand that this struggle is not about some nebulous, ethereal thing about saving something called the planet. This struggle is fundamentally about whether humanity can fashion a way to mutually coexist with nature for centuries and centuries and centuries to come. Put differently, this struggle is about securing our children and their children's future. And for that reason alone, we all should say, as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as grandparents, as future parents, that we will not spare anything in what we do to ensure that we secure their future. Because if we have any sense of intergenerational justice and inter intergenerational solidarity, we have to recognize that we are living on this planet as if we don't have future generations coming after us. So uh, to end on a very positive note, Mahatma Gandhi, he once said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. The reality is they're not laughing at us. They're not ignoring us. They are fighting us in the courts. People are being arrested. People are being killed. And if Gandhi is right, if they're fighting us so hard, let's hope it means that we are just one step away from winning. Uh, I, I, I will ask you to hold your applause uh, because I'm out of time. But I just was moved to end to go back 
and, and end uh, on the way I ended my speech to this audience more than 10 years ago, which was a personal anecdote. Uh, it's a sad story, but it's intended to be motivational, so I hope you take the motivational stuff out of it and leave the sadness for me to deal with. So, when I was 22 years old, fleeing, to, uh, fleeing the country into exile, I had a conversation with my best friend at that time called Lenny Naidu. And Lenny uh, was a very philosophical guy, way ahead of his time. And actually at that time, I have it under good uh, authority that he was probably one of only 1,000 vegetarians, self choosing vegetarians on the entire African continent. And, uh, he, was, he, was ahead, he was ahead in multiple ways. Uh, and then the last conversation I had with him just as we were fleeing into exile at the age of 22, he asked me this philosophical question. He said, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution you can make to the cause of humanity? And I said, oh, that's very simple, going out, getting killed and becoming a martyr of some sort. He said, no. It's not giving your life, but giving the rest of your life. I was 22 years old at the time. I don't know what he was talking about. So we flee into exile in different directions. And then two years later, I get a call that my friend Lenny and three young women from my home city, Durban, were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in their bodies, their parents could not recognize them. And I had to think deeply. Uh, about uh, what he, he was making, the distinction between giving your life and giving the rest of your life. Today, the street where, he grew up, where we grew up is the main street is named after him. That's the only memorial to him in, in the township where I grew up. That was an opinion piece I wrote for the Sunday newspaper in my hometown on his 25th anniversary of his murder uh, just last year. But what he was saying is the struggle for justice the struggle for peace, the struggle for fairness. These struggles are marathons, they're not sprints. That in fact, the biggest contribution you can make, you know, listen, it doesn't take too much of skill to go out, participate in a demonstration and get shot and killed. Let's, let's, let's face it. In fact, take Robert Mugabe. If Robert Mugabe got killed in 1980, the world would simply remember him as a person who played a very important role in the liberation struggle. Today, the majority of people in Southern Africa, Africa and the world consider him to be somebody that stands against human rights, stands against uh, the interests of the Zimbabwean people and so on. So the biggest contribution we can make as people who have been privileged to have knowledge, awareness and certain skills that we can contribute to making the world a better place, the biggest contribution that we have can make is committing all the energy we have for the rest of our lives until the various issues that you are working on are dealt with and justice has been achieved and so on. So I want to end by saying to you, if you are anything like me, then I'm sure there are days where you have self-doubt, that you ask yourself, my God, does all of this work really matter? This fundraising proposal didn't come through and I was banking on it. And now I can't do this project or that project. I just want to say to you, dear brothers and sisters, that when you hit those moments, just tell yourself this, that the world would be an incredibly more pessimistic place were it not for the work that each and every one of you do and each and every one of your organizations do. And on behalf of my friends at Greenpeace, I'd like to just say I wish you well in all that you do. And as Greenpeace, we stand ready and willing to partner with all of you in our joint fight to create a more sustainable, peace, peaceful, and just world. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.